Okay. And the red box is around you, you're live. There you go. Okay. Welcome everyone to the uh, Trinity and Roughly uh, Ward Forum meeting. And I hope everyone's keeping well. Um, I'm Councillor David Pears, and uh, if I may also introduce my colleague as well. Uh, Ewan, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, uh, my name's uh, Councillor Ewan Mackey, and Councillor for Roughly Ward, and thanks very much for joining us this evening under these slightly surreal circumstances. Okay, now on the agenda tonight, for anyone who's listening in, um, we should have a COVID-19 update um, from a lady called Mary Aware, and we're having a report on waste management from Leslie Williams. Uh, should be a report on the Commonwealth Games, which might be a written one. And we're going to have a town council update. And during the meeting, we've got access to um, taking questions um, from anyone who may uh, want to raise them. Now, we'll try to answer the questions, but we might have to come back to you um, at a later point. Um, I need to let everyone know um, that the meeting is being held in public and the reporting the recording will be available for public future records. So uh, there we go. So welcome all. Um, first item then on the agenda is item number three, which is COVID-19. And Mary, are you are you there? And would you like to give us an update, please? Councillor Mary hasn't been able to join us yet, so can we move on to waste management, please? Thank you. OK, that was a swift report. So we we'll move on to Leslie Williams, who's the depot manager, who's responsible for the waste management and collections across all of Sutton Coalfield. Um, so, Les, would you like to uh, give us an update in terms of where we are and where uh, how, how we're coping through the, the poor weather? and collections and those sort of things so that everyone is informed. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Councillor. Thank, thank you. Um, evening all. Thanks for the invite to come along this evening. Uh, I think since we last met, we might be another year older. So uh, we don't look a year older for the people I can see. So that's really good. Um, <laughs> waste management. Um, we've had a challenge in the last 12 months, as everybody else has. Uh, COVID has hit us. Um, we've been able to keep collections on track. And dare I say, collections have been really good um, for the last 12 months. Um, we're now over the Christmas period. Uh, Christmas period can run on for many weeks, with, uh, depending on weather, etc. But we did get over the Christmas period within a couple of weeks. So uh, we've had a short spell of uh, catching up. And then unfortunately, last week ended us with the snow. Um, that's affected Monday's collections this week. And I know some of you good people in Sutton Coalfield on Tuesday it will have affected you. Um, we are planning to get this picked up and I'd urge you or ask you to leave your bins out because we're looking to work this weekend. Uh, firstly, we're coming for your recycling um, so we can get that cleared up as quickly as possible. And we are looking to, if possible, to come for your residual bins as well. Now, if we don't get to them on Tuesday when we do come as normal, we'll take your bin as normal. And if there's any reasonable amounts of side waste, we'll take that with us as well. Um, you might see that across the city now we start to get some new vehicles coming in. We've had a delivery of about 18 up till now for these services and that's based across the city uh, and up until May there's about a further 35 coming in. So that's like our first tranche of new vehicles. Once them are all in um, and they're predominantly recycling vehicles because we've been having some issues with the old fleets. Um, any any anomalies we've got with recycling will be sorted out, I would suggest. Also, the fleet that we've got now are what we call narrow track vehicles. So a narrow track vehicle gets into tons of places. It holds a little less, but we can go with that. But they, they don't take as much footprint on the road. They're a lot narrower, so they can get in some of our roads that are a bit tight to drive up and down. So we took that approach so we can get in where we have problems or we've had problems in the past. We're also replacing our. Can I ask everyone to uh, take their cameras off except Liz? Um, That's it, Liz, you're back on screen now. The broadband okay. is a bit ropey. Yeah, okay, sorry about that all. Uh, so our new vehicles will um, 
standard in good stead. Um, for the next four years, we'll be buying new fleets. So it's a continual thing that we do. Also, our street cleansing fleets, the mini sweepers we've got, we're just taking delivery of new mini sweepers. I think petty bars have come in this week. So the, the new sweepers are obviously brand new, more economical. Um, they do a cleaner job. We've got a bit more training we got to do with the guys um, and we've got them for 12 months and then we're looking to procure our new ones of our own then. We've just extended the hire for 12 months while procurement takes place. Unfortunately, COVID stopped that. Uh, also on street cleansing vehicles, we're just in the process now in the next month and so, the summer already, the, the small dumping vehicles that we've got, they're being replaced as well and they're just like a really tiny dust cart. I'll be out within the wards looking at the dumping, picking up uh, anything that we see, obviously. And again, the, it's a compaction type vehicle, so we could do more work in them in a day. And, and we're also now looking at our cage tippers. So we're looking at renewing the whole fleet across the board. Uh, because we're so big, it does take a bit of time. Um, but that's about it on waste management, I feel, at the moment. But if anyone's got any questions or queries, I'm more than happy to take them. Okay. Well, thank you, yes. Les, for that uh, summary of where we are. Um, are. Has anyone got any questions? Yeah. Of Les, Ewan. Yeah, thanks, David. Um, just a question I was going to ask was the, um, I've had some people asking about sort of recycling tipped into the general waste. Is, is that something that happens because it needs to, or is that something that happens because sort of um, there's no other options, or is that just sort of where there's there's been some confusion with the, with the uh, with the crew that are operating at that time? Um, I'd probably say not the latter. The crew should know what to do. Um, there's a number of reasons why we may mix waste. Uh, in some instances, that um, if we've had waste there for a long time, it does get contaminated, uh, and we take that pragmatic approach to pick it up. Um, we, we had one just this week and it was one of our new vehicles and it broken down, uh, well part of the back broken down and the crew used what they thought was their initiative to just scrap that bit of waste. Obviously we've put them right since so we don't want any mixed waste because uh, it doesn't add very much to our recycling figures. So we're actively all the time trying to stop it so far as possible and as I say of our new vehicles they are purpose built for recycling, so we'll get that recycling on. Having said all that, if we do scrap waste, it's not just thrown away, it does get burnt in our energy from waste sites and it's turned into electricity. So it's not dead, but it doesn't uh, attract any recycling rates, which is what we're more than keen at getting in. Yeah, I, I think that's brilliant. Because I must admit, our recycling rate has fallen to a to a to a level, and it'd be great to see it getting sort of back up to some of the dizzier heights that it has been in the past. So thanks a lot, Les. We really appreciate that answer. Yeah, just to add just one bit more on that, Kaz. We're we're just about to step into a program of education. So lots of people, through lots of reasons, are not recycling in certain areas of Birmingham, not everywhere. We're going out now. Our workers can record the low participation. And we're going out with waste prevention, our managers and the crews, and we're going to be encouraging people to recycle. And obviously, if we're going to be encouraging them, we want to make sure we offer the service where we do recycle it. So we were thinking about March, April time, that's going to kick off. But there's going to be a big push towards people recycling. Thank you. Thanks, Les. I've got a couple of questions for you. Uh, sort of one follows on from that one, and I expect you've been asked it before. Now there isn't any green waste collection at the moment. Why is it that we don't collect recycling every week? Because that you, you would improve your figures from that and presumably the crews that might have been doing the green waste could participate in that to help us shift more. So that was my first question. And my second question, if you're able to just sort of make a note of it, is that I know a few times I've had to email you about Holland Road and Holland Street around there. And it seems to be cut, become a bit of a, a problem area for the collection service. I don't know if it's because of parked cars or not, but I was just wondering if you could uh, have a look at it and come back to me to later today. Thank you. Oh, yes, let's just before you, you jump in, I would just uh, to add to those. I just noticed that um, I think we've got a resident who's asked a question about um, 
is reporting graffiti directed to waste management and if not where? So if you could add that into your previous questions as well, so that, would, that would be helpful. Yes, I don't mean reverse order because I'm afraid that's how my brain works. Uh, graffiti, yes, if you just bring me, or you can do it online if you want to go to birmingham.co.uk, just put in forward slash waste. That'll let you report graffiti. That comes straight to our central depot at Montague Street, uh, and that'll be scheduled for cleansing straight away. Um, I think our turnaround is within a day or two. Uh, if it's offensive, it's straight away, we're at that same day. Um, for that Island Street Council, let me have a look at that and I'll, I'll drop you a note separately on that. We'll Thank, you. Thank um, you. And it might be that if we've got problems there with collections our new vehicles, we're changing bits of rounds, not days or weeks, but we're changing vehicles. So we might add a road on to one of our narrow track vehicles and take it off somebody else. To ensure that you. Can and then your first question was, can you remind me please? It's recycling. Why don't we collect recycling oh, carbon yes, bottles sorry. every yes, week? Sorry. No, there's not a green waste collection because that would that would really help the figures, wouldn't it? Yeah. Well, across the city, we have twelve uh, garden waste crews. Um, the season usually ends early December, which actually starts our busiest time of year. So we deploy them guys and girls over the, the Christmas period and times like this bad weather now. They support and they help the crews have a clear up. Um, oh, right. So it, it's in our scheme of numbers of crews, we've got 179 crews and there's 11 on garden. That we wouldn't be able to go to a weekly collection across the city. But okay. if we, we've got any spare, we, we, we deploy them to some of our areas and use them on dumping and all sorts. Um, make it, while, while it's quiet, we actually have a good clean up with them guys and girls. Okay, thank you. Uh, you mentioned about graffiti, and that reminded me. Uh, there's a BT box at the end of Manor Road as it joins Clifton Road in Sutton Coalfield that's been daubed with something really pink and horrible. I went past um, today, so if you're able to just make a note of that one and add it to the list, that would be excellent. Are there any other questions for Les? Uh, okay, I've seen the question from the resident, which I think we've answered that one. Um, so there being no other questions on my screen, I'd like to thank you Les for what you're doing and the crews are doing. It's not the best of weather to be out there doing it. So thanks all for what you're doing. Yeah, I agree with that Les. Thanks very much for coming along. Really appreciate giving up your, your evening for this. Thanks a lot, mate. That's thank no you. Problem, thanks for the invite. But thank this you. is a party note. Um, we are expecting or predicting more snow on Saturday. Uh, Hopefully it doesn't land on us. Um, it's nice to go out on the sledge, I would agree. But uh, <laughs> socially distanced, obviously. But it might affect collections again early next week if it comes down like last week. But just to make everybody aware, if we don't come because of weather, leave your bin out because we will get to, we'll assure you of that. Okay, well, I hope nobody asks you to get your skates on then, Les. So thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> thanks for the year. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Take care, we'll be safe. Right, yeah. thank Thanks you very much. Okay, then. So I think I saw Mary in the wings uh, come in on on the. Are you able to come in, Mary, on the COVID nineteen now? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? Yeah, Mary. Yes. Can you put your camera on, please? And I can. Do you want, do you want to just introduce yourself as well, Mary? Because we did some introductions just at the start. So if you could, that would be good. Thank you. OK, so um, my name is Dr. Mary O'Reilly. I'm a consultant in public health and I am um, here at Birmingham City Council. Um, I'm also the assistant director for Test and Trace. So I'm here on behalf of Dustin Varney, um, but on all things COVID is, is my day job. So I'm here to give you a sort of brief update on the situation and then take any questions. Thank you. OK, far away then. So if you could share with us what the news is in Southern Carlfield. Um, I've got a bit to say about the Town Hall a bit later on, but um, if you can share with us and uh, maybe there may be some questions as well. Thank you. OK, so the, the, the situation obviously start from a big picture. Um, Birmingham as a city, our rates are still incredibly high, but they are on the way down. They're not going down as fast as we'd like them to. 
Um, but if I share with you some very specific information about. Oops. Let's get this right. No, it's not loading. Sorry, I was going to share with you some uh, slide, but I'll try that again later. Um, so the situation we've got at the moment is uh, a, a burning rate in the last seven days of 584 per 100,000. And we use that so that we can compare ourselves um, using a rate across the city um, and indeed with other parts of the country and nationally. But this compares to 726 um, you know, in the seven days before. So it is going down, but as I say, not as fast as we'd like it to be going down. That puts us position wise um, at the 18th, 18th highest in England compared to other upper tier local authorities. The key thing about the transmission at the moment is it appears to be primarily spreading through social interactions. So we've got uh, the bulk of people who um, have COVID, the new cases identified are of working age. So typically between 30 and 60, that's where we have most of the people who are testing positive. Um, there seems to be some association with people um, getting COVID at work, but also for people who don't go out to work at the moment when they do pop out to supermarkets and through social interaction. So it's a combination of people picking up um, COVID, transmitting it in their workplace, um, and then also taking it home and spreading it. Um, hospital admissions uh, in the last uh, seven days have been mostly between about 100 to 150 new cases every day at um, University Hospital Birmingham Trust. So that is still a significant pressure. And in terms of how this plays out, when case, case rates go down in terms of cases detected, that's people testing, there's usually a lag of about another two or three weeks before that is reflected on what happens in hospital. So if I go more specifically um, to talk about what's happening in your ward, um, for the seven day period 19th to 25th of January, um, Trinity was 59th out of 69. So one of the lower wards for COVID cases um, with 40 reported cases in that period. Um, that's a rate of about 4.32 per thousand, but it compares to a city rate of 4.75. So definitely lower than city average. Um, still on, on Trinity, that shows that you had, like the city, 30% of them in the 30, 20 to 39 age group, 35% in the 40 to 69 age group. So about 65% of your cases, 66%, two thirds, were between 20 and 60. So again, it's that going to school, going to study, higher education, going to work age group. Um, much fewer, as obviously, at, at the extremes of age. Now, if I move on to what that means for us um, in the, oops, hold on. All right, so that was Trinity. I'm just trying to share with you a picture. It's a picture, hello. Hello, yes, I'm still oh, here. Oh yes, you can still hear me, sorry. Yes. My, my screen's gone mad, mental. Um, share that. So this is what I'm trying to show you. Tell me you can see. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Great, OK, so that just sort of shows you pictorially what I was describing um, about age groups. Um, Birmingham in blue uh, and Trinity in red, so slightly lower on the 20 to 39, slightly higher and the 40 to um, 59, um, but but similar for the next age group, which is 60 to 80. Um, if I move that on. And show you my ethnic group, that would not surprise you. Um, again, Birmingham in blue uh, and, and the ward in white. Sorry, in red, I'm talking about white here. Right, and then we move on to the second ward. Now, similarly, 40 reported cases in the previous seven days that we looked at. Um, the rate compares much more closely to the Birmingham population. Um, 4.75, 3.45, so again, much lower, sorry, than the Birmingham population and even lower than Trinity. So as wards, it sounds like 
a good position. Um, and we do take into account where these where these cases um, happen within the ward. So sometimes we'd be looking to see is there are they happening in homes? Are they happening in care homes, in care settings? Um, have we had outbreaks in workplaces? But that's not been the case for yourselves. So this is about people who have gone out, picked up the virus, um, brought it home and then sometimes transmitted it within the home. Um, I think the, probably the next thing that I'd want to mention to you really is showing you the same sort of picture. And you can see the age groups. It's mostly the 20 to 40, the 40 to 60 as I've shown you, and ethnicity as I've described already. So what does that mean for us in our, our regular work? I'll just stop sharing. What that means is that we're having to work on, on two fronts. We're working with workplaces and people who go to workplaces. So those people are national lockdown. People should only be going to work if they have to and they cannot work from home. Um, that means we're working with people trying to engage them and show how you can keep yourself safe as individuals. But we're also working with employers across the city and I know that our neighbouring local authorities are doing the same. And it's a combination of carrot and stick. Um, there is a sense of fatigue. That's the message we're getting back um, that people are vigilant, but they've been vigilant an awfully long time and we're asking them to continue to be vigilant. So when we look into outbreaks in workplace settings, the story that comes back is um, people are very vigilant 90% of the time, maybe 95% of the time, and then they stop for a lunch break or they go out and have a fag together closer than two metres or not not more, not up to two metres apart. Um, or they had a quick huddle because somebody was leaving or somebody had joined. And it's those times that we find that transmission is occurring. So the message with um, both the workforce and with employers is how what else can we do to help keep people safe and, and overcome that fatigue in terms of the messaging. At the same time, it is not inevitable that when a person gets COVID, they take it home and it must spread within the household. So we've been promoting something called germdefense.org, um, which sets out very clear, simple steps that you can use so that even if a person is a case in a household, they can isolate safely. It's not inevitable that it spreads through the home. And that is where we're getting the majority of our cases in Birmingham. Um, I appreciate that that's going to be more difficult for some people, depending on the number of people in the home, the layout, etc. Um, but that's that's one of the areas that we, we have to work on. So that brings me on to our COVID champions. Um, we have a considerable number of COVID champions now. We're in the upper 500s. So that's been a huge effort on, on part of so many people. For your awards, we're looking um, at 22 champions but we could do with a few more in Trinity um, as case rates haven't fallen there much in the past two weeks. So we know that our champions are very varied. They're ordinary people like ourselves who happen to live across the city. And what we're trying to do is to get a representative number in each ward. So in addition to looking at the total number of champions, which is what Justin will talk about, I'm looking at, well, how many champions do we have in each ward? And we've adjusted that by the population size. So we're saying as a first first stop, can we have more champions in certain wards so that we've got representation by number? And then we would look to see, well, what else can we do? And we're trying to get feedback from the champions as to how we've done so far, what information they're getting, how useful they're finding that, what questions they're getting out in community that they can't answer. Can we provide that information? So for anyone who's listening today, I would encourage you, if you're not already a COVID champion, to sign up. It's really simple. We don't ask too many questions, so we don't need to know all, you know, blood type and everything. It's just join up, get some information from us, but also give information back to us because you're our eyes and ears about how COVID is being experienced in the community. I think I'll probably stop there and take any questions. Okay, uh, thank you <coughs> yeah, very much for that. Sorry. And I think uh, I think Ewan's going to 
um, have a question, but if I might just slide one in just before you and comes in. Um, <laughs> just, just can you just share what the COVID champions do? I mean, you've said eyes and ears, but that doesn't, that sounds like sort of big brother looking around, seeing what people are doing, but it, it, it's surely not that. So <laughs> is it, is it, could you just put a bit more meat on the bone? So if you, for anyone who wants to volunteer, and there's a lot yeah. of people who do voluntary work across all of Sutton, got a better idea of what that might involve them doing. Thank you. Right, yeah, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, so the first thing about COVID champions is they have access to the information we put out, which is reliable, it's trusted, um, it's genuine. There's a lot of misinformation out there about COVID and we can put out information and they, they know, right, that's from a trusted source. All the information that goes out, I check, my team check, what is the source? Are there government sources? Some of it is publicly available data, but rather than hearing word of mouth from someone, we can say, no, we got that from the council, the COVID champion, this is reliable. So that's the information going out. It also gives you a bit of detail about what's going on in the city, um, what opportunities there are to shape how we will work together and get through this. I think perhaps when I mentioned about being the eyes and ears, it's because I'm mindful that I'm looking for it to be a two way conversation. So we're not just looking to use COVID champions as a conduit to get messages out. We're also looking for COVID champions to be a conduit to give a message back to us about the community and about our residents. Um, you know, are you able to get tests when you want them? Do you know what the procedure is? Are you able to get isolation payments should you need them? Do you know in what circumstances you can do that? All of those sorts of issues, anything about COVID that would help keep people safe. Um, there's an opportunity for someone to ask the question and if it would be Justin, uh, one of the team who will answer it, it goes out, you know, right, okay, that's genuine, that's correct information. As things change, we also update. So you can imagine through late November, November, December and early January, we had a huge number of changes in terms of what tiers we were in, what we could do. We put the messages out there again, combating it, misinformation and the infodemic, as I call it, is as important as dealing with the, the physical experience of COVID. Thank you. Ewan's got a question. Yeah, um, it's a couple, if I, if I may, Mary. Um, yeah. um, the first one is that if I've got the figures right, um, Sutton uh, roughly ward the previous week had 50 cases, fell to about 37 there, thereabouts. So that's like a drop of about 26%, which is in line with Sutton Coalfield. We saw a drop of about 20%. But I see that Trinity Ward went the other way and its figures went up 20.6%. Now, I've noticed from looking at these figures there that even when we were in the in the thick of it and the figures were going up because these weekly ones are so much like a snapshot that sometimes you would get these zigzagging around anomalies. So is that sort of blip for Trinity? Is it just a bit of a one off? And the second question I was going to ask if I may to leap in with that was that I noticed that in other areas of the city, there's quite a few community pharmacies that are doing lots of good work. But when I look at the list in certain, there's not that many, certainly things like testing and things like that, very little seems to be going on from the pharmacies in certain. I was just wondering why that was. Is it is it just because we've got mostly Boots and, and Lloyd's Pharmacy and not too many sort of independents? Or I, I just um, struck me as a bit surprised by that. But, um, but yeah, the main question really was just that, is the Trinity one with it going up? Is that just a one-off sort of blip and it's just the way that the figures have fallen for a week which can be a bit misleading. Yes so typically if, if I were putting information out I would want to smooth the data because um, I mean yes my team and I we look at it every day and we're like up down up down. Um, some of it is to do with when did people get tested you know we did see a pattern some months back about oh yeah people weren't getting tested during the week um, or they get tested at the weekend and then the, the tests come through. So some of it is to do with that. Some of it is to do with access and what's availability there is, um, what else is going on in people's lives. We saw a drop off over Christmas. Presumably people decided they would rather not test um, even though there were test facilities. So I would say um, it, it is difficult because we do want to monitor it, but we shouldn't read too much into a single week, a single day. 
um, certainly averaging and a trend is what we're looking for. Um, the other thing to say is that because we are all so connected, um, when we see something goes up in one ward, you know, you're using the community facilities by the shared by several wards and people move around to do their shopping. So the situations that we're looking for to see, you know, was was it in a shop um, where they're wearing their masks? Is there a situation there that we need to investigate could affect several wards and people's behaviour isn't always the same. So people's behaviour in terms of how quickly will I get tested or will I get tested at all? That varies. So I'd say cut yourself some slack and look at the trend. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Mary. Really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Ewan. A um, couple of other questions then. Um, don't know if you can answer these or not. Um, we are uh, expecting next week to have the town hall open for the uh, inoculation injections, etc. Um, do you expect um, the number of cases to fall in the next couple of weeks after the, the, the programme is rolled out more in Sutton Coalfield? Do you expect um, teachers in schools to be um, getting inoculated in the next round so that the schools can get open for Easter. Um, we hear various things on the national news and obviously you're there on the inside. I just wonder if there's any further information you can share um, to give us an inside track really on um, where we might be going to say if we're talking to you in a month's time. OK, uh, so yeah, great news that we're getting vaccination locally. And I would obviously I would encourage everyone who gets called up to to take that opportunity. Go get your vaccination. Would we expect rates to fall? So there is information given to people about how we need to behave, particularly in sort of three weeks or so after vaccination. Um, vaccinations take a little while to work, so it's not a case of I had my vaccination on the Monday and whoopie do I'm off you know, um, going crazy on, on Tuesday or Wednesday. There is advice that you can you can, you um, protect yourself, I would say, um, exercise caution for a few weeks. Um, what we would expect to see is that for those people who were at risk of death and hospitalisation, because that's how we prioritise vaccination, we would want to see a reduction. I'd say the first place to look for that is probably going to be in your care settings. Um, but then also people who are over 80, then we're looking at people who are over 70 and the priority list will continue. Um, so how soon would we see a fall? I'd like to say that those people who are at risk now, but not getting COVID, when they get the vaccination will have added protection. So they were, they're not necessarily people who would have become cases because if they're able to stay at home, keep themselves safe, maintain appropriate distance. They're not they're not the people who would have been getting the vaccine. Um, sorry, getting the been cases right at the moment. Remember I said most of our cases are in the 30 to 60 age group or 20 yeah. to 60 age group. And typically they are not the age group that's being vaccinated. There are exceptions and we will work through that. That's a JCVI um, decision about the prioritisation. But the, the, the purpose of, prior, of vaccination at the moment is to reduce hospitalisation and to reduce deaths. So the people who are able to go out to work um, and, and people who are able to go out and about are probably not the people at highest risk of hospitalisation and death because otherwise they might have been shielding, um, they might have been older. So I think we're protecting those most vulnerable and it will take time to work through to others. So if I move on now to your question about teachers, um, teachers and schools. So it's been a tricky one. Um, we totally understand that there's lots of, um, there are lots of children, typically but schools are still open. Um, you know, vulnerable children and children of key workers are going to school. We do want to protect our whole community, teachers and pupils. But at the moment, they're not the highest risk. They're not the second highest risk. They're not the third highest risk. Typically, they are um, of an age where they can go out. Um, they are typically of good health. Um, and so they wouldn't fall into the, the categories of people being vaccinated at the moment. 
Now the vaccination categories will evolve as we get through, as we progress. So at some stage that will that will get to um, people such as teachers. However, is that likely to happen in time for Easter? I can't say. I really can't say. I think what we what well, when we were going into lockdown, some of the things we considered was, was the NHS able to cope? And when we get to a situation where we have protected enough of our um, community that is over 80, enough of our community over 70, and the other at-risk groups that are being worked through, so we reduce the hospitalizations and reduce the deaths, that may have a bearing on you know, being able to reopen. So for teachers specifically, I'm afraid, I can't give an answer there, but generally speaking, they are working age, reasonably healthy. They're not the highest priority just at the moment, but that will come. It's going to come to all of us. OK, thank you. Are there any other questions? I can't see any uh, on the system. Leslie, are there any other questions that you're aware of? I think one has come in, yes. Um, from, it's not yes. showing on my screen at the moment. So, okay, I've um, got it's, oh, I've got one. Yes, I have got one. Apologies. Yes, I've just found it. Um, so, Mary, we have got a question. It's suggesting the question is um, Germany is suggesting HZ vaccine not suitable for ages over 65. Is this fake news? So, I don't know if you're able to answer that question. I haven't heard anything to that effect. Um, but the vac <coughs> excuse me, the vaccines we're giving out at the moment, and we've prioritised, as I say, the over 80, the over 70, and then certain other groups that are particularly vulnerable will be suitable for those age groups. Um, I would also say that each we've got what we call the 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 JCVI. Um, it's a joint committee for vaccines immunisation, they look at all the evidence and they advise the government. Each country will have its own way of looking at things and, and reach their own conclusion. I, unless I lived in Germany at the moment, I wouldn't be too concerned about messages about what's happening in Germany. I'd be concerned, much more concerned about what's happening in the United Kingdom, certainly what's happening in England. Um, I would also direct people if they've got any concerns, the Birmingham Solihull CCG have a really excellent website that gives information. This is an NHS led thing, although the local authority is facilitating, we are encouraging both workforce and the wider community to take up vaccination as and when we're called. This is very much an NHS led issue. Having said that, um, I've just worked with a colleague to do a presentation this evening um, so that we can inform our COVID champions about vaccination and busting some of the some of the myths. But um, at the moment, I, I wouldn't be concerned about um, what's being considered from Germany. Um, our information is about the vaccines we're giving and if they're being offered to people um, over a certain age, then our opinion is that they are suitable for them. OK, thank you very much. I, I can't see any more questions. Um, if that is the case, then I'd like to thank you very much for your time. I, you and I can see you talking, but you're on mute, so I don't know if you're asking a question. Uh, I was. Thank you, David. I, I sort of thank you. Glad you're the IT expert. Um, what I was trying to say was that um, before I realised that David pointed out I was muted, was that um, I, I have heard what the resident was saying there and I think it's quite interesting that there's a German newspaper that is that is making this comment um, about the over 65s and they're just looking at the test data but Europe itself I don't think has approved the um, AstraZeneca vaccine yet and so I think that I think, I think it may be tomorrow actually that they make their decisions so it'd be quite interesting to see what they do because if they say that everyone can use it it might just show that build newspaper was just trying to sell a few newspapers rather than um than do it and i think there was a misunderstanding about what eight percent is as well but i'm not sort of totally um clear on that but i know that the official line from what i've read elsewhere is unsurprisingly that um astrazeneca vaccine is approved for everyone and it's safe and it will give them full protection as vaccines do, uh, within the limits of normal vaccines so uh, but i'm obviously not a doctor i'm just someone who reads the news <laughs> mm. thank you okay mary do you want to comment any more on that or are you okay i i think um 
on, on, a, on a serious note, the um, we do refer to it as an infodemic. The, the amount of misinformation out there is, is scary and we have to um, we have to be wise about what we spend our time considering and what sources we have. So I would direct people, I mean, that's one of the reasons for saying sign up as a COVID champion, but also sign up to the NHS website. We have been fairly transparent about what we know, what we're doing, why we're doing it. And sometimes that means we get a bit more information and then there's a change in policy. Some people take that as a weakness and think oh, it wasn't clear. We don't know what you're doing. If we are not agile, if we don't adjust to new information, you know, that would no, that would be no better either. So I think we need to accept that. This is a relatively new virus. It's it's a cousin of an existing virus, but it's relatively new as it is. And we are all learning really, really quickly. Um, but where you go to to decide is that worth thinking about any further or not? I'd say use the NHS website, Birmingham Sully Hall NHS website for vaccines. Really good. Um, become a COVID champion. There are loads of opportunities to also send questions in. Um, there are loads of sessions. We do Q&A sessions with loads of groups. What we don't know, we'll say to you, we'll go and find out from our colleagues and come back to you on. Um, but, you know, wisdom is also important. Um, choose your source of information. OK, thank you very much. If I was being a sceptic, I might think it was something to do with uh, ruining our exports to Germany, but uh, I shouldn't say that. But there we go. OK, well, thank you very much for <laughs> for that presentation and uh, well, let's hope the workload drops off over the next few months for you all and thanks for everything you're all doing so thank you Mary. thank you thank you um, back to the uh, agenda then so um commonwealth games then um, leslie have we got a, an officer with us tonight or is there a, a written update there please there's a written update have you got the written update councillor mackey oh do you want me um I think I did download it. One moment. <laughs> Councillor Pears, can you put your video camera back on, please? Yes, I'm here. Where are you? I'm here. <laughs> Let me scramble for it. Just when I saw it said someone read it out in the meeting, I didn't realise that was going to be me. <laughs> so let me scroll down. Right, I think I've got it here in front of me. Um, bullet points that we've been supplied let me know if i'm reading the wrong one out uh, the commonwealth games legacy proposals for boldmere gate sutton park were consulted on between the 3rd of december and the 4th of january um, as a reminder sutton park is going to host the triathlon and the para triathlon events for the games on the 29th and the 31st of july 2022 Boldmere Gate needs to be upgraded to meet the international triathlon standards and provide spaces for temporary athletes facilities, media compound, etc. The, pro the proposals will provide legacy benefits for Sutton Park by improving the existing Boldmere Gate car park nor north of Miller and Carter, with new surfacing, a second entrance to the car park from Stonehouse Road, formal disabled parking bays and the installation of electricity cabling and hookup connections. Currently plans will see construction take place later this year, so there are new facilities all available for use well before the Games. There were 76 responses to the consultation, 62% rated the proposals as good or very good compared to only 12% who think the current facilities are good or very good. Suggestions for additions to the scheme included new toilets, a cafe. However, these were unfortunately beyond the scope of the works of the Commonwealth Games. A planning application has now been submitted for the works, which the public can comment on until the 19th of February. And I think actually the actual details have gone up because originally they didn't have them on. And the new and the application reference for this on the Birmingham uh, Council's planning website is 2021 
oblique slash 00528 oblique PA. A separate planning application will be made by the Birmingham 2022 Organising Committee in due course, covering the various temporary structures needed to support the triathlon events. And um, I hope that um, I hope that uh, is clear enough. Does David, did that make sense to you? I, I, I heard it all. Thank you very much. Um, has anyone got any questions on that um, statement that's just been read out on the Commonwealth Games update? No, there's nothing come through, Councillor. OK, well, Are we, uh, have we heard anything, David, that the Games will definitely go ahead? Because I've heard that the Tokyo Games were then put back and then then there's talk of the, are the Tokyo Games going to be held? Or if, say, the Americans said they didn't want to send send their athletes, um, there was then obviously the thing is, would the Games take place at all? Is Have we heard any updates on the Commonwealth Games? I, will that be I, happening? I, I, I haven't, but I think that's a very good question that perhaps um, Leslie might be able to take back to um, the centre to um, get an answer on for us. Okay, um, yeah, I'll, I'll ask that and, question for you. Thank you. And, and for our next meeting, um, if I may be so bold to ask, um, Sutton Park um, has been the sanctuary to a, a great number of residents um, during the lockdown and has become extremely well used and that's good for people's health but um, the environment in the park through damage caused from vehicles is less good news um, so there is uh, a lot of work to be done there i believe to get the park restored and put back to how it, it used to so i think it'd be quite relevant if we could ask an appropriate officer um, to come to our next meeting um i wouldn't i think it needs to be a higher level than the constituency park manager i've already asked the uh um, the lead member for the parks for what action is to be taken councillor john o'shea because um, it won't be just sutton park across birmingham it could be all the parts um, that are suffering but sutton is the biggest and so has got the most damage um so i think for the next meeting that would be um, very relevant. Would you and like John O'Shea to come? Sorry, David, would you like John O'Shea himself well, to come? I, I, think that we ha I, I think it would be very good, um, Leslie, if he was able to come to our next meeting um, to share with us what action is going to be taken, because having the top man there is the best way, probably, of getting more action taken. And could, Les could Leslie um, just say to him that we will be nice and we will extend a warm welcome to him in the Royal Town? Because he may never have been before. Okay, I will. I will email uh, Councillor O'Shea tomorrow and ask him for your next meeting. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. So, um, so that's that, that's all I can say. So, any other questions on that one? Okay. Thank you. Um, moving on then to Town Council update. Um, so th this this is where Laurel and Hardy come in um on that one and, i uh, think i used abbott and costello i much prefer that version david well yeah well, i just just thought yeah well, i was a little fine mess i was getting into but um <laughs> uh, so i thought um, we, we would talk about the town council next because uh, not everyone's with the lockdown possibly aware of what's been going on and there's a lot of good news out there and i know that um you and will want, want to contribute as well so i'll just share a few, a few little things um the town rangers, um, these are the people who have been going around doing extra work where the street cleaning operatives from Birmingham City Council and others haven't been able to do it, uh, have done some tremendous work across pretty well all of Sutton and there's regular updates on the town council uh, website um, on there. Um, the officers in the uh, town council have been working very hard during the lockdown with volunteer groups and helping in a, in a number of ways. And the town council's also been looking at grants. Um, and in particular, um, and more relevant, um, we've got an extremely good example of where the whole community have been working together with the town council. So the town council is taking the lead on working with um, volunteers linked to St. James's Church 
um, in bringing them forward to help support three sessions a day. So that's 27 to 30 volunteers needed a day to help um, man the queues and look after people that will be coming for their vaccinations at the town hall from Monday next week. So if there are any volunteers out there wanting to step up and come forward um, to help with this, this key issue, um, if they go to the town council website, there's a, there's a form there where people can participate. Um, linking in with this, um, the community, uh, um, in the words, the, the, town, the townhouse uh, pub has provided their car park free of charge. Um, Ewan has been working with the leader of Bone Council um, on some work to do with Anchorage Road car park, so I'll let him come in on that in a moment. Um, the, the town council working with highways engineers are introducing a TMO, so that's like a it's like a, a it's a regulation order, traffic management order that will make it easy for pedestrians to cross the road from the car parks to the town hall to um, have their inoculations and get back to the cars thereafter, and also the town rangers will be used to help clean and tidy the sites. So. Um, that's just a little bit of information. Ewan, I think you've got some information you want to share on that as well. Um, thanks very much, uh, David. Uh, the, I mean, I, th I think the town, the town council has been very busy and I, and I think that, like everyone during lockdown, it's sometimes difficult for people to appreciate exactly how many things are going on. I mean, the, as David said, the town, the town council really uh, led the voluntary campaign with the assistance of Healthy Aged. And uh, some of the stats of what, how much people have been helped and how much food deliveries have been made have been quite astounding. And I think the town council's really come into its own. It's given, I think it was um, £50,000 to be able to sort of, from its coffers, to really support the voluntary effort and make sure the most vulnerable were looked after during this situation. But there's been some, what I would call, beautifully mundane things done as well. I mean, the um, the bins in Harvest Fields Park in Roughly Ward at the north there, they, whilst they were Birmingham City Council owned bins, Birmingham City Council said that they couldn't um, replace them and being metal bins, the they look at the, some of those sharp jagged edges, I felt they were dangerous. And so Birmingham City Council's only response was that we haven't got the money, so we're gonna have to take them out. And I was really quite proud that the town council um, approved that. I feel quite pleased that it went to the committee and colleague David Pears here tonight. It's always good when you've got a friend who's chair of the committee and I'm sure he didn't show me any particular favours extra than anyone else but his committee approved the town council to pay for all those bins to be replaced and and that was the old traditional style where you've got your general waste bin and your separate waste bin there for the animal waste and things like that so it was quite handy that when you put people putting things in bins, you know, find well where your hand's going, so to speak. So I, I think that was really very useful. I think this, the speed cameras have still been positioned around and about. They've been paid for by the, the town hall. These ones are not that give tickets, but they just warn motorists that they're speeding and slow down. I think they're very important. The one coming in Slade Road there coming in just at the north end of uh, the town because you've got traffic that's going at uh, 60 miles an hour and of course when they hit that 30 mile an hour limit they, it takes them some distance sometimes it's the traffic lights at Weeford Road but it's the first opportunity for them to slow down so that matrix there that just points out to them that they're doing 20 miles an hour or so over the limit um, I think it's really important and really got to thank the town council because that's thousands of pounds that that cost uh, to put that in there so I think that's really that's something that's excellent. I've got to thank the local businesses as well. I've, I've been out with um, uh, Kabir Rudin, who owns the Bashandura. I mean, he was up, I think, he, um, about to go into, for an operation, so I, was, I wasn't able to go with him yesterday, but I've been out with him other times, and he's been delivering hundreds of meals. There was 100 meals were delivered to one of the schools um, just recently. He delivered, I went with him to Good Hope Hospital, and he delivered food hundreds of meals was delivered and I think it's excellent when the community comes together like that but on the vaccination centre there that David uh, referred to um, the main car park next to the town hall uh, that has been given over by Birmingham City Council to the um, for the use solely of the vaccination centre and it's really important and myself David and the other town councillors has had to really um, be supportive to the bid because 
the North Birmingham area that could have gone anywhere, you know, and we felt we had a duty to our own residents, sort of um, certainly the senior ones to get somewhere as close as possible. It could have gone over the border into Streetly, it could have gone further south into Erdington or, um, and so, but we put a really strong bid together to make sure that it was, that it was the, the North Birmingham one didn't go to Perry Bar or anything like that. So here it is here in Sutton Coalfield. So that's excellent. So we don't have to go to Millennium Point. We don't have to go to um, Aston Villa Grand. We've got one here in North Birmingham. It's in Sutton Coalfield. And I think something we should be proud of because it could really easy, that could have gone anywhere else. And that have been very difficult for our older um, members of society to get there. So, um, and one last thing, it's not a town council thing, but I'm really proud of it that the observer's gone, which is a real shame, but we've all been working very hard and we've been speaking to the people at the uh, Express and Star and sort of they've agreed to open a paper to launch in Sutton Coalfield called the Sutton Chronicle. Obviously, lockdown every time they're just about to launch gets in the way. And so, of course, because they can't deliver a free newspaper during lockdown. So um, that's obviously back on pause again. But I'm looking forward to when Sutton Coalfield can have its own newspaper and report its own news because the Birmingham Mail and the Birmingham Post, as, as their names, cl the clues in the name, isn't it, are very centric to Birmingham. And when they do report Sutton Coalfield, um, they're lo they're the way they refer to certain roads and certain locations in Sutton, I think they may use a dartboard for deciding that areas in Roughly and Vesey, et cetera. But I've probably gone on for a long time, but uh, I hope that for everyone that found that interesting. Uh, thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you, Ewan. And I think the other thing that I've heard as well is that the Chronicle will have a wider spread, I think 40,000 or so was a figure I heard, uh, which is a bigger reach than the previous paper. So that's uh, good for more residents to know about what's um, going on. Um, OK, now, um, whilst you were talking, Ewan, we did have a question come in, which uh, I think related to the Commonwealth Games. And it's talking about provision uh, proposed for ingress and egress from the town gate for pedestrians from the station. So I know that's something that was brought up in the past um, that I raised um, with the officers who are managing this Commonwealth Games because they want more people to go by public transport. Um, and I think that buses are to be laid on, um, but for people who want to get to the station and walk through the park or whatever, it's not clear the answer on that. So again, um, Leslie, maybe that's a, an answer we can get for um, for the next time we get a report on that one, please. Yes, Councillor Pears, I'll send an email on that one too. OK, thank you. I haven't, oh, have I got another question come in? I'm just having a look to say. Uh, no, I don't think there are any more questions. Uh, are there any questions on the town council at all from anyone listening in or any town councillors who might be listening in? Nothing's come through yet, Councillor, but there could be a 40 second delay. So what I was going to say was, do you have a date in mind for your next meeting? Have um, you got a date you might want to suggest to us? Well, traditionally you have a Thursday evening and normally the next one would be Aprilish, so the 15th, 22nd or 29th. I'm thinking uh, of when I invite the cabinet member. Um, let me just get my diary, it won't be a moment. Thank you. So what was that date again, so Leslie, just so I can... The 15th of April, 22nd of April or 29th of April. Um, I'm sort of wondering about um, the 29th of April, you and if does, how does that fit in with yourself? I think that fits in really well. I, I like the sound of that. OK. okay. Is, is that all right then, There's in the next meeting, seven o'clock on the 29th of April? Yeah, it's done. OK, so, thank you. Uh, OK, well, that being the last item on the agenda and I haven't got any more questions in front of me, I'd like to thank everyone for uh, attention tonight and uh, I hope you're able to join us for the next meeting and um, in the meantime, keep warm and keep safe. So thank you very much all. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much.